church family, Santee Circle Community Church online. Good to see you guys. Pastor Jeff here with the praise team. No, I am not singing today. I know you guys were getting excited at home. That, that is not going to happen today. Uh, I just wanted to welcome you guys to our online worship. You know, this is pretty cool that we get to around the world worship together. Uh, there are going to be people in Honduras, which I'm pretty sure Miss Mel is watching today uh, in Honduras checking in, and you're doing it in your living room. Some of you aren't even dressed yet. You're probably in your pajamas. That's okay, because God says come as you are, right? Um, for those of you guys who are just coming in late, just remember, th- we're going to be doing something a little bit different over the next couple weeks, and this worship might be a little awkward. It might be a little different. Um, you might feel the urge to raise your hand. Guess what? It don't matter, because it's just you and your family. It's just you and your kids. Maybe your dogs are watching. It's, it's going to be a good time, okay? Here's what I want you guys to really do is to lean in, okay? What I mean by that is not like get closer to the screen because your eyesight's bad, but really try to do something different, okay? And what I mean by lean in is this is going to be a a really cool word that Pastor David has for you today. I'm really excited about God's word. Anytime you open God's word, right? But especially in this time of crisis, people are looking to us as Christians for hope. They're looking to us for a reason for why we are so excited, why we're so jacked up when the world's in pandemic, okay? Um, when we worship, man, Pastor Rick and, and the fam here, plus Kurt, right, is going to be jamming. And they're going to be in here worshiping with us who are gathered at the church. But when you're in your living room, parents, man, you get an opportunity to show your kids what it means to worship, right? Like, guess what? They're going to get bored. They're going to run around. It's going to be okay. I want you guys to know that when we're here together, the word of God is going out. And I hope you guys share this. I hope you like it. I hope you comment back and forth as, as several of us are here. We're going to be able to message back and forth to you guys what's going on. But as we get ready to worship, here's what I want to do. Let's just calm it down. I'm talking to myself mostly. Calm it down, and we're going to pray. All right, so if you guys would bow your heads, kids even at home, bow your heads and close your eyes, and we're going we're gonna to gather to pray for our worship time. God in heaven, Father above all. Man, you are so mighty. You are so powerful, Lord. There is nothing in this whole world that could stand against your kingdom. There's nothing that will prevail against the forces of God. Satan thinks he might have victory. Satan might think he's winning by keeping us all at home. But, Lord, your word is going out all around the world. And we want to lift you up high today. We want to praise you as we're gathered online. Lord, we we ask that that a pouring out of your special favor would go everywhere into your sons and daughters as we gather together to to block out distractions, to block out all the things that we have to do around the house or, or all the worries and concerns and cares we have about what might happen or what is happening, God, because we know that you have already been there. Your word tells us, Lord, that that you know our beginnings and ends. You knew us before we were formed in our mother's wombs. You knit us together in the the utmost parts, uttermost parts. And Lord, I just pray right now that that we, in that intimacy that you created us, we would find it again. Lord, that in the middle of chaos, we would hear one clear voice. And that is the peace of God that says, you know what? Everything else in this world don't matter. Only I do. Help us focus on you today, Lord. Help us to lift you high. Please be be glorified and be pleased with what we do here. Father, I love you. I know that this church body loves you. I know the people watching online love you. If there's anyone here who doesn't know you, I find I pray that they find hope. I pray that they find the answer to what their life and their heart has been searching for today. As we worship you, God, I pray that even in our pajamas, you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. So wherever you're at, we're going to worship him. So God already has it all in his hands. Scripture says that he is everlasting. And so as we begin our worship time, Psalm 90, and Scripture will be there on the screen. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth is the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So Lord, we worship you this morning. Let's worship him together. The same God that never fails, 
will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, but nothing can stand against such a surprise. Nothing can stand against Yes, I choose to pray To glorify, glorify The name of all names but Nothing can stand against Oh, yes, I will If you have In the lowest valley Yes, I will Bless your name This morning, Lord, Lord, we thank you. God. Thank you. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome. the power of his blood. Amen. Amen. Yes, I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one who never ends because he lives. was dead in the grave. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my
it's just a reminder of just God's goodness and his faithfulness in, in all through circumstances. And so as we continue to worship here, um, let's, just, let's just lift up our hands in knowing that the God who is everlasting, has everything, as we said, holds it in his hands. And Psalm 46 really reminds me of that. Just so much of the fact that even though things are around us, even the mountains quake and the seas are, you know, uh, roaring and the waves are crashing, he is our refuge and strength. And so let's read that together here as we see it on the screen. It says, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. It's a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters in foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. And God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdom totter, and he utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we just lift up our praises to you. Lord, we just know, God, that you are there. Let's continue to worship him, church. We will always 
overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome. Yes, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. God, we are, Lord, in awe of you. Lord, your scripture says that you are everlasting. Lord, you are faithful through it all. Lord, and though the things around us may seem so uncertain, Lord, you tell us to fear not. Fear not, for you are with us. And so this morning, Lord, we are declaring that as a church. Lord, for everyone, Father, that is um, just focused on you, Lord, we want our hearts to be poured out to you just in this time of worship through songs and through prayer, Lord, and through, Lord, just reading of your word. And so we thank you just for this opportunity. Lord, we thank you for the, for the privilege, and we thank you for just the, uh, Lord, for the technology that allows us to be able to do this together. And so, God, I, I just lift up, um, Lord, those that are just working this morning and this, this, this whole week, Lord, that are our doctors and nurses, Lord, that have just been spent, was count, spent countless hours, Lord, just uh, caring and treating, Lord, and giving themselves in this most difficult time. We lift them up to you, Father. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those that have been impacted, Lord, from their jobs, uh, Lord, from just family life, from the schools, not being able to go to school. Lord, we pray for our families. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the hope of Christ to shine all those times, Father, we just want to hold fast to you. And Lord, for our leaders, Lord, for all the um, those that are making those um, difficult decisions, Lord, and wise decisions, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for guidance. We pray, Father, that um, Lord, truth would be abounded, Lord, and that everything that we're doing here, Lord, is, is for for our well-being, Father, to, to Lord, to just Lord, care for, for one another. Lord, for the sicknesses, we just want, Father, for everything, Lord, to just point towards you. And Lord, I just pray for our, our pastor this morning. I pray for Pastor David as he brings the message of hope. Lord, I know um, this week has been crazy, and it um, seems like just from day to day, Lord, just um, we don't know what tomorrow brings, but we're thankful that we can search your truth, hear your word this morning, and we pray, Father, that you would... Um, Lord, just pierce our heart, Lord, with your truth in our time together. So, God, um, we pray that your will would be done. We pray, Father, for your glory to be seen in all of this. So you're so good and worthy of all the praise. Lord, we pray this in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ, the one and only, his name. What's up, church? Great to be in the house of the Lord um, this morning, and, and it's great for you to have a part um, to play in this uh, amazing time in which we live. You know, each of us um, 
Each of us are experiencing this pandemic in a little bit of a, a different sort of way. Um, but each of us have a role to play during these challenging, unprecedented times we live in. This coronavirus pandemic, um, something that I think none of us in our lifetimes have really ever experienced before. And you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us uh, that there are many in this world around us, many in our communities um, that are struggling. They're struggling to come to grips with the reality that we live in a fallen and a seemingly uncertain world. And I thought about that this week. Um, the word uncertainty, do we live in an uncertain world? I think we live in an uncertain world under the authority of a God who is certain. Um, and I think that's something for us to remember this morning, especially for all those of us who are in the church, because there are people around us who are anxious. They're concerned about an invisible enemy that's on the prowl, wreaking havoc in communities and countries worldwide. They're afraid that the virus is going to catch up with them and their family members and friends, and that they're worried about what happens if it does show up and affect someone that they love. The fear, the worry, and the anxiety that has taken the world by storm is not what God desires, not what the Lord Jesus desires for our lives. How can we in the church help others during this crazy time? How can we as individual ambassadors of Christ provide comfort, courage, and compassion to those who feel so helpless and so hopeless during these troubling days? Well, in keeping with the old airline adage, in the event of a loss of cabin pressure, we put our masks on first before we worry about attempting to help others. And that's what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to remember who we are. He's calling us to remember whose we are. And that's the way that we're going to impact this world in a way um, where we can demonstrate, that we can show them comfort and encouragement and confidence from the truth of God's inerrant, peace-supplying, and powerful holy word. This is a time for us to squeeze every drop of wisdom, knowledge, and truth from God's holy word. And you know, this is how we're going to make lemonade out of the lemons that we seem to be oversupplied with right now. And you know, the Bible tells us that knowing the truth sets us free, and it allows us to be everything that God desires for us to be. So over the next two Sundays, we're going to be edified and strengthened as well as uplifted and challenged by two very similar yet vital lessons the Lord Jesus taught his disciples during the trials they faced while they were out on the Sea of Galilee. I'm entitled in this two-week series, Life Lessons from Galilee. You know, Jesus did the vast majority of his ministry um, in Galilee. He didn't do it in Jerusalem, which was ultimately um, his focus, but he ministered all around the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee was a source of life, but it was a source of physical life for the people that lived um, in Judea, but it was not the source of spiritual life Jesus was, and he did a lot um, in the lands around the Sea of Galilee on the shore of Galilee um, to teach um, his disciples and his followers more and more about the Christian life. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 4 this morning, and we're going to be in some verses that have helped define um, the way that I see God, the way that I know God to be. We're going to see God himself um, in a way that we need to remember him every single moment of every day, even when we're facing these storms of life. And so we're in Mark chapter 4, and Jesus has just finished up teaching the people about the Christian life using several parables that you probably have heard from. The first being the parable of the four soils. And if you remember, he described the, the hard, padded down soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and then the good soil. And he likened um, the environments that we live in. Um, he, envi he, he essentially used these four different types of soil um, to explain the different types of lifestyles um, that we can live. And then that, in turn, he leveraged into helping us see how the average person, the four ways that an average person can respond. Jesus covered all of these four different spiritual environments um, to reveal um, the different ways that we could interact, the way that we could um, practice and, and be fulfilled by God's holy word. And you know, he talked about things like worries and insecurities, the distractions of life that come with wealth and the pursuit of materialism 
um, in the impact that it was having on their first century lives. And he also touched on the process of spiritual growth and how spiritual growth is a lot like scattered seed that once planted slowly grows into whatever it's going to become. And that tells us a lot about the spiritual life. And we'll see that demonstrated here um, in practice here by the, the disciples uh, out on the Sea of Galilee. And then Jesus finishes up with a few other parables, predominantly explaining the dramatic growth um, of God's kingdom as being like the growth of a mustard seed. If any of you have ever seen a mustard seed, you know that a mustard seed is very, very small, but it grows into a huge, a huge tree that even birds can prop themselves up in. And so Jesus and his disciples had been teaching, and they've been ministering to the people all day, and now they've reached days in, they've reached evening, and Jesus has determined that it's time for them to take a break and to move away or to take a break from the throngs of crowds that have been following them around um, and to actually go over onto the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So they dive in to the boat and they depart. They push away from shore. And this leads us now to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Seven powerful verses that I think are going to help us see um, a lot about where we're at today and the way that we are responding and the way that we should respond to the challenges, the tragedies, to the difficulties of life. And what we're also going to see, that the disciples, when they pushed away, thought that they were done learning for the day. But what they found out was their learning was not quite complete. And so we're in chapter 4, starting in verse 35. And it starts like this. It says, On that day, on that day that Jesus was teaching, when evening it had come, he said to them, Let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling up with water. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, the storms of life, as much as we try to avoid them and outrun them, they almost inevitably always seem to catch up with us somehow, don't they? In the words of author Joel Stuckey, storms threaten to sink our faith. These are not everyday inconveniences like a flat tire or a hassle at work. These are days when we are apart from one another, one another, when your regular work lives are totally different, when some of you are working from home remotely, when you can't go into a store or a restaurant and stay for very long. These are weird days. These are um, unprecedented days for us, but the inconveniences of typical life, like a flat tire and a hassle at work, that's nothing compared to what we're facing today with the fears and the concerns that this virus on the move and spreading um, across the world um, could possibly be coming and could affect any of us um, in the days ahead. These are the difficulties that cause us to question God's goodness, a prolonged illness, a death of a loved one, a loss of purpose, maybe a marriage lost and destroyed, and it seems like God is asleep and nowhere to be found. I hope that's not where you are, church, this morning. And if you're listening here um, through Facebook Live this morning, um, and, and you really, in all honesty, when you look in the mirror, you see someone that is scared, someone who's concerned about um, where they're going to get the supplies they need to live. Maybe you're concerned about the fact that you've got some type of an underlying health condition that makes you more susceptible um, to this virus. Um, I'm really reaching out to you this morning to help you see that God is not asleep that God um, is somewhere to be found. He's right there near you if you'll just reach out and touch him, if you'll just reach out and speak to him, if you'll just reach out and call out to him, cry out to him and ask him to come and speak with you. We say too many times, if God really cared, if he really understood, then surely he would stop what's happening to me or what's happening to us. We pray for forgiveness, thinking maybe we did something wrong, we pray for healing and for relief. 
He prayed for deliverance, for opportunity, for reconciliation. I mean, anything that the storms that bring with them, we pray for anything that will cause this storm in our life to pass. And this leads me to ask a question. What can we do to ensure that we're able to weather life's storms in a way that minimizes fear, anxiety, and doubt, and maximizes confidence, courage, and peace? And the words that God gave me this week are these. John 3, 30 through 31. John the Baptist, I believe, says it best and said it best when he said, he must increase, I must decrease. The one who comes from above is above all. John understood that he needed to decrease, that the time had come for him to decrease and that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ needed to rise up in him in order for him to be able to fulfill and carry out um, the, the remainder, that to finish well his ministry that God has started on earth. And we have to do the very same thing. We have got to decrease. We've got to recognize that we can't make sense out of any of this. And there's no one to blame for this. You can blame Satan. And Satan is taking advantage of this. He's causing people to get worked up. And he's trying to convince you that there's no God, that God is asleep, that he's not paying attention, that God really does not love you. Satan is doing everything he possibly can. And he's working through every aspect of life to convince you um, that he's not paying attention right now and that he's left you to your own designs and your own um, measures. You know, and we have to realize that that's absolutely not the truth that God offers himself that for if you're a, you're a believer in Jesus Christ here this morning, you have the very spirit of God that lived in Jesus Christ, that allowed Jesus to perform the miracles that he performed and ultimately raised Jesus from the dead so that he could go and be at the Father's right hand, which is right where he is right now. And what is Jesus doing there? He's interceding on your behalf and mine. Jesus knew this coronavirus is coming long before it ever showed up. And in fact, if Jesus didn't, does not cause it, he allows it to come. And so there's something good. There's something powerful that God's doing right now. And we have to trust him. Do you trust God that even in these difficult days, in these valley light, valley days, um, rather than being on the mountaintop, God's allowing us to go through these valleys for a reason, that he's up to something. I believe God is up to something. I believe he is seeking to revive his church. I believe he's waking up his church, a church that has been asleep, um, that has been complacent, that is not fulfilling um, the mission that God gave us. He's waking us up. He's shaking us up out of our comfort zone. And he's reminding us that we can't do this down here on earth without him. We need the spirit of Christ to increase in us as we in like kind decrease. We need less of us and our stinking thinking and more of him and his holy, righteous, and confident thinking. How do we practically do this? How do we minimize? How do we get rid of the stinking thinking that typically affects us, the woe is me thinking? Well, you do that by, by consuming a steady diet of God's holy word and ramping up our pursuit of him in prayer. The only rescue you're going to find is going to be found in God himself. And where do you find God? You find God in your quiet time. You find God when you're reading his word. You find God when you're praying to him and when he's in relationship to you and when he's speaking words of comfort, when he's speaking words of reason into you, when he's speaking words of deliverance on your life. And we just saw the words from Psalm 46 that Pastor Rick um, had up on the screen here, that God is a fortress. He is a mighty fortress. And that's where we go when we need safety and when we need protection. Where are you going to find protection from the coronavirus? You find it in the Lord. Whether you have it or whether you don't have it, you still find your protection. You still find your deliverance in the same place. You find it in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, you've heard the old saying, desperate measures require desperate, or actually desperate situations require desperate measures. Well, you know what? What we need right now is a desperate desire for the one that John 1.1 1, 1 tells us was with God in the beginning, that had a part to play in creation, and is that God's right hand now interceding on our behalf. That's right. His name is Jesus Christ. That's who we need in the days of this pandemic. The teaching and hearing of God's word is intended to produce faith. That's Romans 10.17. And what do we know faith to be? How do you define what faith is? Faith is being sure of what you hope for 
and certain of what you can't see. It's looking around at your circumstances and having no reason to be optimistic, but yet still being optimistic because you know that God's on his throne, that nothing's happening into this world that God does not know about and that he's not responding to, and that whatever comes your way, God is going to give you everything you need to stand up, to rise up, I mean, to take your stand. Faith is being sure of what you hope for. What do I hope for? I hope that God's on his throne, that he's down here proactively working through his Holy Spirit. I'm hoping that he's going to draw people, lost ones, to Jesus Christ during these days, that he's going to bring some people to the end of their rope. And it's going to be either they accept Jesus Christ or they break down in depression, anxiety, and hopelessness. And my desire, that's what I'm hoping for. But you know what? I'm also certain of what I can't see. I don't trust what I see in the news media. I don't trust what I read out on the Fox News or all the different websites that are talking about this virus. I don't find hope in the CDC, in the, in the, the statistics that they're producing. Um, what you find in those things are typically despair. They typically default to the negative. God's desire is that you would default to the positive, that you would recognize that God is calling us, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, to walk by faith and not by sight. This is what Jesus was looking for out of his disciples, yet it was not what he received at this stressful moment in their lives. More teaching and learning was required for the disciples as they traveled across the Sea of Galilee in this boat. The Sea of Galilee was a, it's a 700 foot deep lake, much, much bigger to us. We have a lot in common with Galilee here. Monk's Corner is right on the edge of a lake. And this was a larger lake. It was actually something they called a sea. But there, were, there was basically this, this lake situated, this sea situated between two mountain ranges. And the cold air would come across the mountain range, and it would meet the warm, moist air coming up. And storms had a tendency to pop up, just like we see happen here on Lake Moultrie. But if you've ever seen Lake Moultrie and what it looks like when a storm comes through, it's nothing like what happens out on a sea on a deep sea like the Sea of Galilee. And these disciples experienced um, a storm above storms. And if these disciples were scared, most of these disciples were fishermen. They lived in Galilee or near Galilee. They lived along the waters. They knew what life was like on there, and they were scared to death. And where was Jesus? Jesus was in the stern of the boat, and he was asleep. Jesus was asleep. The boat's filling up with water, and he's asleep. What does that tell you about Jesus? Well, it tells you two things about Jesus. The first is it tells you that Jesus was man, that Jesus was a human being, that after teaching all day, he was tired. He was so tired that he was able to sleep through the, rain, or the, the rain, the wind, and the waves, even the waves crashing over the top of the boat. Jesus was not worried. In fact, he was tired and he needed rest. And so we see in this morning's passage a, a, a powerful demonstration of Jesus' humanity while at the same time seeing a remarkable display of Jesus' deity. What we see and what we witness about Jesus in this passage is that he is a human being, but that he is also God. And that's the reason why we need to be reaching out to him in these days. Jesus understands what it's like for you and I to get up every day and to get in our boat and to sail away from shore not knowing what you're going to experience at school as a student, at work as a manager or a worker. Whether you're um, a medical professional, you have no idea what you're going to face, what disease you could possibly be exposed to, um, the, the stress of being overwhelmed by lots of people who are sick. Um, God knows um, boat life. He knows the boat life, and he knows how to help us live the boat life. But we've got to trust him. We've got to believe him when he tells us that he is the son of man, that he is the son of God, um, and that he's with us, and that we are not alone, that he is with us to comfort us and to strengthen us and to enable us to thrive even in these storms of life. You know, we see right here in these very scriptures in response to the disciples' fear, we see a reiteration of the fact that Jesus Christ is the master of every situation, and he's the conqueror of every enemy. 
And that includes even a bug, a virus, something we can't see that travels around us, that exists in this world around us. But you know what? To the disciples, in this moment of great fear, they didn't see a master. They didn't see a conqueror. What they saw was a God who didn't care. They saw a God who was asleep, a God who was not concerned about their safety and protection. And you know what? These disciples had watched Jesus perform miracle after miracle and teach and teach. And yet, in the stress and the strain of this moment, they forgot who Jesus was. And the disciples, they got to see one more time, again, that Jesus is the master of every situation and he's the conqueror of every enemy, even a storm, even waves filling a boat. That Jesus Christ, he is the ultimate um, sump pump. That's a weird illustration. But if you're in a boat filling up with water, you want your sump pump to work. And Jesus Christ always intervenes and he always intercedes in your life. Now, I want to be, I want to speak very clearly um, to something this morning that I think is really the heart of the message this morning. And we're getting very close to the finish of this message this morning. Have you ever wondered to yourself, what might have happened had Jesus not calmed the waves? Had Jesus not calmed the wind? How many of you have been in a storm where you were battered and you were beaten over and over again and it lasted days, weeks, months? How many of you are struggling with a condition right now that it appears there's no healing that you're going to receive from it? Well, you're being pounded. You're being pounded into what seems like submission, but the reality is that's not what's happening here. God is with you. If you have a personal relationship with him this morning, God is with you through every aspect of your life. Even if your storm is of your own making, much of what we are struggling with in our lives is caused by our failure to do the right thing. In the disciples' case, they were doing the right thing here. They were sailing to the other side of Galilee. Why? Because that's what Jesus told them to do. They were being obedient to Jesus. But then the storm comes along, and they realize that, you know what, they're probably not going to make it over to the other side. And you may be here today, and you may be thinking that you're not going to make it over to the other side. And the reality is Jesus is right there doing something in your life. He is all about what the, the, the point of this passage this morning is not about the storm. We see the storm. We see his response to the storm, but that's not what this is all about. What this is all about, it's all about the disciples' faith. It's all about your faith in mine. You know, it's about trusting Jesus and recognizing that Jesus, what's Jesus up to in our lives? We see it and we hear it rem reminded, or we were reminded of it um, quite often that we are being conformed to the image of God's Son. That's why the crises and the things that come into your life, God has the power to disperse them anytime he chooses to, but why would God ever allow trouble to continue to exist in your life to the point where you are being stretched thin? It's because God is all about, all about being concerned about your faith and about growing you to be more like Jesus Christ. And what do we know about Jesus Christ? We know that God did not protect him from like the worst situation or the worst experience any of us could ever imagine. If he won't stop that from coming on his son, then why do you think he's going to allow us to get through this life um, scar-free? He's just not going to do that because he sent his son. His son has died for us, and he's reminded us that he can overcome any foe in our lives, any trouble in our lives. All we have to do is have the faith to trust him. You see, the Christian life is very much about perspective. In fact, it's actually all about an alternative perspective. That is, it's all about God's perspective. Do you have God's perspective here this morning? Are you seeing the circumstances going on around you the way God sees them? Have you asked God to help you keep your mind about you and to keep your wits about you? And have you asked him to help you see what he's doing in these days and what you should be doing in these days as his servant, as his ambassador to this world? Have you noticed during the times when you read the scriptures that what you think you see is going on is not necessarily what's actually going on? Have you ever noticed that before? 
This passage is a great example of this. Clearly the disciples, this event was terrifying. They believed that they were going to die, that they were not going to make it over to the other side. However, we see here, what do we see here? We see that in the storms of life, oftentimes in the storms of life, we meet our Father in heaven. So why should you look forward to sometimes um, the trials and tribulations of this life? Is that sadistic in any way? It's not. The reason why is because we oftentimes um, experience God in, in even more significant ways when we're going through a trial than when we are up on the mountaintop when life is good. Those are the times when we seek Him harder, when we're more concerned about self-preservation and we know that there's only one who can guarantee that we can be preserved. Um, it's God Himself, and that's the one that we have to seek. You know, it's in the depths of life's valleys that God often does His greatest work in our lives. It's in times of adversity when we come to the end of ourselves, to the point that we're able to see the power of God at work in and around our lives. And you know, the Dutch watchmaker, Corrie ten Boom, her family was instrumental um, in leading out Jews from Germany, um, protecting them and trying to help them survive the Holocaust. She said this, she said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not still deeper yet. How can we really absorb this truth that God's love goes deeper than any pit you can find yourself caught up in? How can we absorb this truth? How can we demonstrate it? How can we experience that from time to time um, we have to have a pit that's so deep that we're desperate for the Lord? And that's the way God, that's the reason why I believe God allows challenges and trials and tragedies. We live in a fallen world, a sinful world. That's the reason why death occurs. But you know what? For those of us who are seeking to live our lives in a way that pleases the Father, um, why would God allow something like that, something traumatic to enter our lives? It's because He's conforming you. He's making you into the image of His Son. And just as God was faithful to enable His Son um, to meet every challenge, every enemy that He faced on earth, God's going to allow us to be able to do the very same thing. So, therefore, as human beings, as Americans, as believers in his church family, we find ourselves during this viral storm, apart from one another and in self-quarantine, practicing this new thing called social distancing. It's important that we as believers keep a proper perspective, that we keep God's perspective about us and what is going on around us so that we can respond to these circumstances as Christ would have us to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. That's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Let us not be found imitating the faithless response and the fear of these disciples, but rather let us keep our heads about us so that we can focus on the practical ways we can fulfill our mission as the church, how we can serve one another and others and lead lost loved ones and friends to a life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We have no justifiable reason to be afraid, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. We can trust Him because we know God will never forsake us. And that's the word this morning. That's the word that you and I need to demonstrate, that we need to spread, that we need to share. We need to reach out to others, and we need to tell them that we personally, that you personally know a God, a God who loves them, a God who desires to protect them, to provide good things to them, a God that desires that they would not be alone. And if you're here within the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then there could be no more important thing to happen to you this morning than for you to accept Jesus Christ once and for all as your Lord and Savior. And we can use a lot of buzzwords um, in the church and in the Christian faith. We use words like salvation, redemption, and um, you know, uh, sanctification, all the shuns of Christianity. But simply put, what I'm asking you to do right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, I ask you, I'm going to pray a prayer here 
in a few moments. And I ask that you would, if you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, that you would pray these words after me. And these words are not what's going to save you. The fact that you're even willing to say these words um, is just your way of communicating to God that you're willing to accept the free gift that he is offering you right now. The very same gift that many in our church family have already received, and they're here watching this service and participating and being a part of it with the confidence of knowing Jesus is alive in them. And so if you're here this morning and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to bow my head, and I would ask that you bow your head and speak these simple words after me. Father in heaven, Lord, I trust, I trust you, Father. I trust what this pastor is saying, that you do exist and that you are on your throne, and that I trust that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, just as you said you did 2,000 years ago to die for mankind so that all of our sins, so that my sins could be forgiven. And God, I profess that I am a sinner. I profess that I need you to forgive me for my sins. And Lord, I desire that you would give me eternal life, that you would give me your precious Holy Spirit, that he would come and reside in me. And Lord, I commit, I promise that I will serve you faithfully. I will serve you powerfully. Um, I will serve you um, passionately um, in the years that I have left here on earth. Lord, I thank you for your promise that, Lord, if we profess our sins and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you'll hear our prayer and you'll forgive us of our sins. Father, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for this new walk that I'm beginning with you. And it's in Jesus' precious holy name I pray and ask these things. Amen. If you're here and you've prayed that prayer this morning, We would love for you to reach out to us and let us know that you did that so that we can be praying for you. You can go out onto our website at santeeccc.org and there's a place there for you to contact us and let us know that you made that decision. If you're out there and you need prayer um, this morning or you need prayer this week or you're facing something that's coming towards you, um, we want to be praying for you. All of us as pastors, um, we see the things that are sent to us by the church website or even out on, on the Sainty Circle Church app that you can find out in the app store. Um, you can communicate to us and you can let us know um, that you need us to be praying for you and we will be faithful to lift you up and pray. And, and one last thing, if you have needs, if you're in the church and you're outside the church and you have needs that you're struggling with or you're, you're desperate for, please let us know that. Reach out to us contact us so that we can minister to you um, in the ways that we possibly can. If you prayed that prayer that I just prayed this morning, we rejoice with you that you have started your walk with Jesus Christ. And we want to come alongside you uh, in doing that in these days ahead. Just let us know um, that you did it so that we can be praying and we can find ways to, uh, to impact you and to reach out to you in these days ahead. All right.
Thank you, Ann Mary. That was really uh, special. Thank you so much. We we wanted to share the uh, announcements, but we also wanted to uh, remind you that there's still a way that you can uh, give during this time. There's, there's really four ways that we can do that. Uh, the first way is to go to our website, and if you click on the menu up there, there's a, a Give Online uh, section. You can see the arrow pointing to it there. And you can do that via uh, credit card, debit card, etc. We also have the church app. And once you pull the church app up, there's uh, about the fourth card down, there's a Give Online section as well that you can do through the church app. Uh, the third way, of course, is to put it in an envelope and mail it to us at Santee Circle Community Church, Post Office Box 1091, Monk's Corner. And the fourth way is just to contact one of us, and we'll arrange and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way to, to get it uh, for you. So uh, now a few of the announcements. Thank you, Wayne. Regarding announcements, just a reminder, all face-to-face in-person meetings are canceled or postponed at least through the end of the month. However, be on the lookout for a message from Pastor Jeff about virtual youth meetings this Wednesday. A couple of the events that are being postponed or canceled, um, y'all have heard about the dad and youth camp out near Coon Island. We called it, uh, we're calling it Man Out. It was scheduled for the weekend of March 27th through the 29th. We're hoping that that will be, uh, that's going to be postponed. We're hope, uh, hopeful that it will be rescheduled. On March 29th, we were going to have one service with Mr. Clint Eccles speaking. We're hoping to reschedule that as well and the CLM fundraising banquet that was scheduled for April 23rd is also being postponed so in closing one last reminder we recommend that all community groups take a break from meeting in person we want to encourage you to uh, consider setting up virtual meetings and if you need help with that you can contact Pastor Jeff or Pastor Rick before I close us in prayer we, we want to thank you for being with us this morning, and I was watching Brother Stanley before I came uh, this morning, and it was on seeking godly counsel. And this is one of those times that we can take time to focus and seek counsel. And, of course, he said the very first place that you should seek counsel is in his words, but the next place is only 18 inches away. And what he meant by that was the distance between your knee and the floor. And in Pastor Jeff's case, it might be a, a little more. but uh, So this is a, a great opportunity, a great time for Christians to come together uh, in an electronic way and in a, a virtual way to lift one another up and to pray for each other and to help one another. This is, this is a, an opportunity that God has given us. So uh, let's take advantage of it and uh, love one another in a different kind of way. So let's pray. Father, we just uh, we, we thank you, Lord, for uh, who you are. We, we thank you, Lord, that, that you are the rock in the bottom of the boat, Father. And in the midst of our storms, that you are always there. And, Lord, we, we know that the, the disciples, they cried out, cried to you, said, don't you care about us? And your love has never been questioned. Father, you, you alone are the, the definition of unconditional love. So, Lord, in these times, we seek your face, and we see it as another opportunity to draw closer to you and to one another. And so, Lord, we thank you and love you. And it's your son's precious name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>